Okay. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, Yun Li. Uh, she's professor of statistics at Ohio State University uh, with a courtesy appointment in the computer science uh, and engineering department. She works uh, on statistical approaches to kernel methods, dimensional reduction, and regularization in machine learning. She earned a bachelor and master's degree in computer science and statistics from Seoul National University. And she completed her PhD in statistics in 2002 at the University of Wisconsin-Madison under supervision of Grace Wawa E. Yilin. Uh, in 2016, she became a full professor at Ohio State University. In 2015, she was elected a fellow of the American Statistical Association. Right now, she is on the editorial board of the Journal of the Machine Learning Research. And she also has an appointment in the Transactional Data Analytics Institute. She has been visiting us twice uh, here at CMAT. Last time was about five years ago. Um, and it's really a pleasure to have again her here, although of course in a virtual way. Last but not least, um, she is a firm believer that Mexican tamales and tamales purepechas are related to a Korean rice dessert, but because of a lack of experimental data, she has not been able to proof and to publish this result. Okay, please go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for a very nice introduction, Johan. So thank you for having me. And uh, due to the pandemic, I mean, we all hunker down at home and think about all the great places that we have visited. And definitely Guanajuato is one of those places to me. So here's uh, one picture that I want to share with you. So this is picture that I took from a hill overlooking the city when I visited Guanajuato last time. So it was five, year, five years ago. And I have really great memories of the trip and those delicious tamales. So I'm very happy to share my uh, latest research with you. So today I'm gonna to talk about um, how to assess uh, case influence on classification methods. So I will be focusing on support vector machine. And this is joint work with uh, my former student, Shan Shan Tu and my colleague, Yun Zhang Zhu. And this is ongoing work. So I would really appreciate your comments uh, on this work. So let me begin with a few words about uh, why we want to study uh, case influence on modeling procedures in general. So I guess most of you would agree that uh, stability of findings from data analysis is very important and robustness is a desired property for modeling procedures. So to study such property and to measure uh, stability of a given procedure, uh, the question that we ask is um, how much uh, change that we see in the model if we change the data a little bit. And of course, there are many ways to characterize change in the data. And among those, probably the most common and simplest way to characterize change in the data is to delete one case from the data set. The question is um, how much change that we see when we delete one case and depending on the size of the change in the fitted model, we could sort of identify which cases are influential or not. And I want to say that uh, this idea of looking at uh, case influence in case deletion scheme uh, has been studied uh, for long in statistics. And in a way, uh, there has been renewed interest in the problem, although the questions take a new form. So for instance, um, how do we share data analysis result without revealing whether certain individual is included in the result or not? So this is a key question in privacy preserving data analysis. 
And another example is, uh, say, if we uh, exploit the case influence maliciously, then how do we design very deceptive examples to pull a machine learning system? And this is a question in adversarial machine learning for better understanding of the weakness of a system. So let me uh, talk about the idea of assessing case, case influence in um, case deletion scheme. So here's a simple diagram. So we have a um, data set and we consider a modeling procedure. So we feed this data set into the modeling procedure and we get a model out of this procedure. So this F hat uh, indicates the full model that we get when we use all the observations. And to study the sensitivity of this modeling procedure or the fitted model, now we consider uh, deleting one case. So here we delete one case, say I star, and feed in slightly changed data set into the modeling procedure and get a new model out of this. So we have uh, this new fitted model, which is denoted by this F hat less I star. And we compare these two fitted models uh, to see whether the deleted case is influential or not. So if we see big difference between the two fitted models, um, we say that the, the case deleted uh, is influential. And this uh, idea of considering case influence or case deletion has been uh, considered in many statistical contexts. So not only for model assessment, um, as in regression diagnostics, case deletion has been considered for model selection. So for instance, uh, LIBO not cross-validation is based on this idea. And case deletion is also considered for measuring model complexity. So to define model degrees of freedom, we consider sensitivity of the model to cases. And especially case deletion, as a case influence statistics in case deletion scheme has been uh, extensively studied for mean regression with squared error loss. So probably the most well-known uh, case influence measure in regression is Cook's distance. So my talk is about um, how to generalize these ideas of case influence in regression to classification. So let me quickly um, review case influence in linear regression to contrast regression with classification. So here's the definition of Cook's distance from his uh, seminal paper. So if you look at this Cook's distance, uh, here we delete um, case I star and look at the change in the fitted values. So here we have fitted values from the full data model and fitted the values from the leave one out um, data model when we um, leave case I star out. So this is simply uh, normalized squared difference in the fitted values when we delete uh, one case. And if you look at this definition, uh, you see that uh, to be able to calculate this Cook's distance, we should get this um, leave one out fitted models. But it turns out that uh, without actually doing this uh, leave one out model fitting, we can calculate this Cook's distance um, very easily. So it turns out that Cook's distance can be written uh, in this way in terms of the residual for the, the case to be deleted from the full model and the leverage of the case. So here, uh, HI star, that uh, refers to the I star's diagonal entry of the hat matrix. This means that without really doing any leave one out model fitting, we can calculate this Cook's distance easily just based on the full data solution. And the reason for this is that, uh, first of all, least squares solution is in closed form and 
we can find out the relationship between the full data solution and leave or not solution explicitly. Here, in a way, I'm giving you a heads up that uh, for more complex procedures in general, we wouldn't have this kind of nice uh, formula that we can compute easily. And that is the case for support vector machine. So since uh, I'm gonna focus on support vector machine as a particular classification method, um, let me give you a few words about support vector machine. So the support vector machine is uh, for binary classification. Um, and this method looks for a classification boundary that uh, produces large margin between two classes. So for two uh, classes, I'm going to use uh, class labels plus one or minus one. And given a new case X, uh, we we'll look at the discriminant score f of X and use the sign of the discriminant score for prediction. So the support vector machine uh, looks for real valued discriminant function. So here I'm uh, talking about linear support vector machine with linear discriminant uh, score function that minimizes penalized hinge loss evaluated over N data points. So here hinge loss is the positive part of one minus class label times the discriminant score. So by minimizing uh, this, we find a discriminant function that produces the same sign as the class labels. And at the same time, uh, we have penalty, that is the squared norm of the coefficient uh, in the linear discriminant function. And this squared norm is inversely related to the margin between two classes. So the margin is uh, indicated here as the width of the slab between two classes. And the boundaries, the boundaries of the margin, uh, they are defined by one and minus one uh, level sets of the linear discriminant function. So uh, let me review some properties of support vector machine which will be useful for case influence assessment. So first of all, uh, we can show that the solution to the problem, so the, the discriminant function uh, f hat is of this form. So it is given as linear combination of x, the inner product of x and each data point xi. And each case has one uh, parameter, alpha i. This is dual variable or Lagrange multiplier. And these uh, coefficients are determined by solving quadratic programming problem. And one very nice property of support vector machine is that um, according to the optimality conditions, if um, the product of class label and the discriminant score is greater than one for i's data point, then the corresponding coefficient alpha i hat is zero. And in that case, removing that i's data point would not change the solution at all. So the leave on out, leave on out solution is same as the full data solution. So those data points with strictly positive uh, Lagrange multiplier are called support vectors. So for assessment of case influence in support vector machine, uh, we have only to focus on support vectors. And broadly speaking, support vector machine can be viewed as one example of large margin classifiers. So here we have various uh, margin-based ba loss functions that are used in large margin classification. So the basic uh, loss function in binary classification is this misclassification loss or zero-one loss, which is simply an indicator of the sign of uh, this product, which is called uh, functional margin. So if the 
signs of the class label and discriminant score are different, then we have misclassification, otherwise uh, correct classification. And hinge loss for support vector machine is this uh, piecewise linear function. And for logistic regression, we have a binomial deviance loss uh, of this form. For boosting, uh, we use exponential loss. And you can see that all these uh, margin-based loss functions are function of this y times f of x that is called functional margin. And this figure depicts those uh, loss functions. So x-axis is the functional margin, so y times f of x, and indicator function for zero one loss. And this curve in orange, is binomial deviance loss, and the piecewise linear loss in dark green, this is hinge loss. And this curve in blue, it's exponential loss for boosting. And if you see uh, these curves, you can see that um, hinge loss and binomial deviance loss, they are very similar, especially on the negative part of functional margin. All right, so let's go back to the initial problem of extending um, idea of case influence measure like Cook's distance from regression to classification. We have uh, two questions to answer. The first question is um, how to extend Cook's distance in a manner uh, appropriate for margin-based uh, classification. And second question is um, how to calculate uh, leave, one, leave one out solutions that we need to compute case influence measures uh, in case deletion scheme. So our answer to the first question uh, is here. So we could have uh, various case influence measures. So for instance, uh, we could look at the change in the prediction when we delete uh, one case. So by using the zero and loss, we can look at the fraction of cases with different prediction when we delete uh, one case. And we call this classification discrepancy rate. We could also look at the change in the functional margin. So we could look at the difference in the functional margin when we delete um, case i star from the data. And when we square the difference uh, in the functional margin, since we are using plus one or minus one as class label, uh, y i squared is always one. So this reduces to um, this average of squared difference in the discriminant score discriminant scores for those n observations. So this is very similar to uh, Cook's distance, except that uh, f hat here is now discriminant score function, not a mean regression function. And more generally, uh, we could consider an appropriate uh, margin-based loss and look at the change in the value of the loss when we delete uh, one case. So this loss difference measure is uh, more general in that if we go with zero on loss, then this reduces to classification uh, discrepancy rate. So we will consider various uh, margin-based ba loss functions and look at uh, the corresponding case influence measures. So second question about uh, calculating leave one out solutions uh, is not trivial. And in a way, this is where the classification differs from uh, regression. So how do we calculate a leave one out solutions uh, efficiently? So we thought about this approach, given that um, difference between the full data and changed data with one observation out is only in one case. So we could maybe start with full data solution and then find some way to get to the leave one out solution. So how about taking full data solution as a warm start 
And we come up with some way to connect uh, these two problems. So full data problem and leave one out problem. So our approach was to use a homotopy technique that connects two related problems using a continuous parameter. So we introduce a so-called case weight parameter and by varying the value of the case weight parameter, we are going to connect the full data problem to leave on our problem. And uh, using this connection, uh, we find leave on our solutions uh, efficiently. So here's a little bit of a detail uh, on this idea. So what we do is to introduce case weight parameter omega, which uh, takes values from zero to one. And we attach this case weight to the case I star to be deleted. So this case I star is weighted by omega. And when omega is one, then the problem that we solve is the full data problem. So we have a full data solution effect. When this omega is zero, then that means we are leaving out case uh, I star. So we solve leave on out a problem. So we get um, F hat less I star. So idea is to start from the full data solution and reduce the value of the case weight parameter from one to zero to get leave one out solution. And if you look at this uh, problem, in a way, introducing this case, new case weight parameter and attaching the weight to uh, one case does not change the computational structure of support vector machine problem. So we can use uh, all the things that we know about uh, computation for support vector machine. So given uh, value of case weight parameter, as in the regular support vector machine, we look at the optimality conditions and by using the optimality conditions, we can characterize a solution to this uh, case weight um, adjusted support vector machine problem. So as in regular SVM, uh, we deal with this piecewise um, linear hinge loss function, which can be simply written as um, optimization problem with linear objective function with linear uh, inequalities. And we still have same uh, quadratic penalty. So the support vector machine problem with case weight, again, can be formulated as constrained quadratic optimization problem with linear inequalities. So we can derive KKT optimality conditions for the coefficients in the, in the case weight adjusted linear discriminant uh, function for every value of the case weight. So we have kind of similar representation of the discriminant function when we have a case weight omega for a case I star. So this F sub omega of X um, indicates the case weight adjusted uh, discriminant function from SVM. And as you can see, it's of the same form, except that now the intercept A and the Lagrange multipliers, so I'm using a theta instead of a alpha, they uh, depend on the case weight um, parameter value omega, but the structure is the same. So as long as we can identify um, the intercept and Lagrange multi multipliers for each value of case weight parameter, we can uh, determine this case weight adjusted uh, support vector machine solution. So I'm kind of skipping all the details, but maybe here's one slide that shows a little bit about the optimality conditions. So how to identify those uh, Lagrange multipliers in particular when we vary the value of the case weight parameter. So as in the regular support vector machine uh, optimality conditions, when we have fixed case weight parameter, we can show that um, all the N cases can be categorized 
into three sets, depending on the value of the functional margin. So given omega, we have the corresponding um, discriminant uh, function. So you, we evaluate that at each xi and look at the functional margin for the i's data point. So this product could be greater than one or equal, so greater than one, equal to one or less than one. So we can categorize n, observation, uh, n observations into three sets and we call them right set, elbow set and left set. And they correspond to three parts of the hinge loss function. So then um, when we have a data point falling into either right set or left set, we can determine the corresponding Lagrange multiplier values explicitly. And for those data points uh, falling into elbow set, the corresponding Lagrange multipliers, they are between some range of values but then by using these um, linear equations for elbow set points, uh, along with additional uh, linear equation, we can have set of, so system of linear equations for, the, uh, for those variables. So we can determine those values uh, explicitly. So the idea is that um, by keeping track of changes in this, three sets, we can figure out solution to this case weight adjusted support vector motion problem explicitly. So let me talk about uh, a few properties uh, that we can derive based on this. So as we change the case weight, so we start from the full data solution. So when omega is one and we reduce that omega to zero. So we can think about the change in the intercept A and Lagrange multipliers theta. Then using the KKT optimality conditions, we can show that the solution path is in fact piecewise linear in the case weight. And by uh, identifying those change points, we have sequence of um, case weight parameter values uh, denoted by this omega sub m. So in particular, um, if the weighted case i star satisfies this uh, inequality. So if the functional margin is at least one, so if that uh, weighted case falls outside the margin, then the coefficient pass is constant Otherwise, this coefficient path changes linearly with non-zero slope. And as a corollary, uh, we can talk about the change in the functional margin as well. So the slope of the functional margin will be zero. Again, if the weighted case falls outside the margin. So that means this is correctly classified and it's outside the margin or on the margin. Otherwise, uh, the slope of the functional margin um, is non-zero constant over the interval between those change points. In addition, uh, we can talk about uh, nice monotonicity of the functional margin path. So as I said, the functional margin changes uh, piecewise linearly, but the functional margin of the weighted case in particular we can show that is non-decreasing in case weight parameter omega. And this result is uh, analogous to the monotonicity of residual in uh, case weight in regression. So what it means is that if you attach more weight to the case, then the residual will be closer to zero. But here we are talking about margin weight classification. So the directionality is now different. So having large functional margin is akin to having small uh, residual. And this result uh, shows that as we increase case weight parameter, the functional margin will uh, increase. So later I will show you a simple illustration of uh, this fact. All right, 
So our computational approach to finding Liebonal solutions in support vector machine is to consider this continuous case weight parameter and change the value of the parameter from one to zero so that we can connect full data solution to Liebonal solution. So we can devise path following algorithm, which is very similar to those existing algorithms for support vector machine, regular support vector machine and quantile regression. But those solution paths um, are indexed by penalty parameter lambda. But here we are considering solution paths indexed by case weight parameter omega. So the idea is to um, keep track of changes in the three sets and at those change points, we identify the solution by solving a system of linear equations coming from the KKT optimality conditions. And by using the piecewise linearity of the solution paths, we simply linearly interpolate those solutions at the breakpoints in between. So that way we can generate the full solution path when the case weight parameter decreases from one to zero. So let me show you some numerical examples. Okay, so here um, I am showing you the discriminant score pass when the case weight parameter changes from one to zero. So here, X, the x-axis is omega. So it ranges from zero to one. And y-axis is the support vector machine discriminant score for some cases that uh, I selected from uh, simulated data. So in this picture, we have uh, eight cases and their class labels are given at the right end. So we have three positive cases and five negative cases. And as you can see, for positive cases, when the case weight parameter increases, their discriminant scores either strictly increase or at least they are non-decreasing. And similarly, for those five negative cases, you can see the directionality so the discriminant scores, they either strictly decrease or at least non-increasing. So that's the monotonicity that uh, I was talking about. And another um, aspect, so if we look at a few cases that are non-support vectors, so let's look at the value of the discriminant score when omega is one, so we get the discriminant scores from the pool data solution. So for instance, the top uh, example, so it's with class label one and its discriminant score is strictly greater than one. So this point is non-support vector. And as, as we expect, the value of this discriminant score doesn't change with uh, case weight parameter value. So it's just a flat. And same is true for the bottom two negative cases, they are again um, non-support vectors. But in between, for support vectors, we have a piecewise linear change in the discriminant score, and we have that um, described monotonicity in the, in the discriminant score or the functional margin. And we did a very simple numerical experiment uh, to test this idea of calculating uh, case influence uh, measures. So we looked at the handwritten digit data, focusing on two digits, so three and eight. So we took a subset of 100 cases of digits three and eight, and we picked 10% of cases for each digit at random and flip their class labels. So we are purposely creating mislabeled cases. And we apply support vector machine 
and calculated uh, case influence measures uh, by using various loss functions. And we wanted to see the relation between the case influence measures and those mislabeled cases and whether we could use case influence measures to detect those mislabeled cases. So here we have uh, some result. So this figure uh, shows uh, ROC curves for various case influence measures when we uh, considered different loss functions. So we looked at hinge loss, deviance loss, exponential loss, and zero one loss, also functional margin itself. And uh, in this figure, the x-axis is the fraction of cases that we check from the top ranked one according to each case influence measure. And y-axis is the fraction of those mislabeled cases that are correctly identified. So the closer the curve is to the top left corner, the better, the more effective in identifying those mislabeled cases. And this result uh, indicates that uh, exponential loss and binomial deviance loss, they are most effective. And hinge loss and functional margin-based um, influence measure, they are intermediate. And if you use zero on loss, so if you just look at the classification discrepancy rate, it is, most, uh, it is least uh, effective. And this is uh, actually expected. It's because zero on loss is not sensitive enough to capture the change in the discriminant scores. So based on this result, uh, we could say that um, they going with binomial deviance loss for defining case influence measure would be a pretty uh, reasonable choice. All right. So, so far I have talked about um, how to use case weight adjusted support vector machine uh, solution pass to calculate um, extension of Cook systems in classification setting. So that was sort of a device that we used to calculate case deletion statistics. But in fact, case weight adjusted solution itself could be very useful in assessing case influence in a more comprehensive or more refined way. So that idea has been already considered in regression by Dennis Cook. So he looked at uh, this case weight adjusted Cook systems. So instead of looking at the leave one out solution, now we look at case weight adjusted um, regression. And again, we consider change in the fitted values when a particular case is weighted by omega, which is less than one. And so we can sort of look at this uh, measure as a function of case weight. So the graph of this measure is uh, called case influence graph. And here's kind of simple illustration uh, as to why this could be useful uh, differently from case deletion statistics. So this is directly from uh, Cook's paper. So here we have two influence graphs as a function of case weight parameter. So if you just focus on case deletion statistics, then that means we are comparing these two cases when the weight is zero. So at zero, these two cases have the same um, distance. So that means they are equally influential. But if you consider the range of case weight parameter value, then clearly case A is more influential than case B. So, by considering this case influence graph, we can have um, more refined assessment of case influence. And this idea can be easily used in our setting because we have case weight adjusted uh, support vector machine solution path. So we applied this idea to our setting. So just to go with general description, we can choose um, any reasonable loss function and consider the change in the value of the loss function. And we compare the pool data solution with 
case weight adjusted solution. And we look at this change as a function of the case weight parameter omega. So then we have a um, case influence graph in a same way. So when we apply this idea to linear support vector machine using the binomial deviance loss, we have case influence graphs looking like this. So we did this application to the same uh, handwritten digit uh, data with mislabeled cases. And on the right, we have similar case influence graph for logistic regression. So if you compare these two, then uh, qualitatively speaking, these two case influence graphs are pretty similar. Uh, one notable difference is that, uh, again, for a support vector machine, we have those points non called non-support vectors, and their influence um, is zero across all the values of case weight uh, parameter. So we have flat lines here, but for logistic regression, we don't have um, those flat lines. That's uh, the only difference, but overall, they look uh, very similar. So once we have uh, this kind of case influence graphs, then we could summarize uh, influence of each case, for instance, by looking at the area under the curves so like AUC, but using case influence graph. And we can use that uh, summary statistics um, as an alternative to the case deletion statistics. So we try that idea. And this is the result. So these are um, from the previous uh, two plots. So we are comparing the area under case influence graph for logistic regression and linear uh, support vector machine for the same data. And here, the red circles, they indicate those mislabeled cases. And those uh, points laying uh, very flat at the bottom, they are the non-support vectors. So based on this, uh, I could say that logistic regression case influence measures are more sensitive to mislabeled cases. And we do see difference between logistic regression and support vector machine. And this is somewhat unexpected it's because uh, they have very different mechanism of determining the discriminant score uh, function. And in a way, this result reveals that uh, support vector machine is more robust uh, than logistic regression. All right. So uh, one more uh, idea that I want to talk about is that um, so far I mentioned that we could look at the change in the value of the loss for case weight adjusted solution compared to the full data solution and look at the area under the case influ influence graph and use this as a measure of uh, case influence, and this could be taken as global influence, but we could also consider very local influence. So by looking at the change um, around the case weight parameter value uh, equal to one, and that was the idea again, uh, Cook considered. So he defined local influence of a data point as the coverture of the case influence graph at one. And there's some connection between this uh, local influence measure and global influence measure. So when the case weight parameter is one, we know that the change is zero. So at one, this value is zero. And if the rate of change of this uh, difference in the loss at one is zero, then this local influence can be taken as quadratic approximation to global influence. And something nice about local influence compared to global influence is that under some conditions, this local influence can be calculated 
just based on pool data solution. So you don't have to uh, calculate leave one out solutions or even case weight adjusted solutions to calculate local influence. So in that way, we can have uh, computational savings. And if local influence very similar to global influence, we could easily use um, local influence as a replacement of global influence. So again, uh, we tested this idea um, using support vector machine, so given that we have uh, this case weight adjusted solution. So based on the case weight adjusted, adjusted solution, we can uh, explicitly talk about the rate of change in the discriminant score uh, path. So we can calculate, so we can show that the rate of change of the discriminant score is zero if the functional margin of the weighted cases uh, satisfies this uh, inequality. So it's kind of same inequality. So if the weighted case falls outside the margin, then uh, the change is, rate of change is zero. Otherwise, we can find the explicit expression for this rate of change. It's pretty long expression, so I didn't bother to include it in the slide, but that is something we can uh, calculate uh, explicitly. And that is based on the full data solution only. And using this, uh, we can compute local influence. So if we use continuously differentiable loss to measure the change in the two solutions, then the local influence measure is shown to be a function of this rate of change in the loss and the rate of change in the discriminant score. And these two are just a function of the pool data solution. So to be able to calculate this local influence, we don't have to uh, get the leave one out solutions or case weight adjusted solutions. Although this result actually comes from uh, the availability of case weight adjusted solution paths um, mathematically, but numerical calculation of this does not really involve any other uh, computation than getting the pool data solution. So we compared local influence and global influence using the same uh, data. So here's uh, one uh, result that they can show to you. So this figure shows um, Lagrange multiplier values alpha I hat in the top panel. And second panel, we have global influence measure. So that is the area under case influence graph. And that is calculated based on the case weight adjusted, adjusted solution. And the third panel is for local influence measure. So, and that is based on this full data solution. And uh, the last panel is about simply the loss of the fun simply the value of the loss function that we use. And for all three panels, uh, we used binomial deviance loss. So here, um, x axis is the observation index. So it, it is from one to 200. And based on this, uh, we can sort of compare uh, lo local influence measure and global influence measure. And again, the red circles are the mis mislabeled uh, cases. And by comparing these two panels, uh, we see that local influence measures are pretty similar to global influence measures. So, so this means that we could easily take a local influence measure as a replacement of global influence measure. Uh, in addition, if you look at the Lagrange multipliers uh, themselves or the value of the loss uh, for each observation, we can see that case influence measures, they capture something different from these uh, simple um, numerical values that are attached to each case. So R pi hat and loss value, they are different from case influence measures. And I want to mention that unlike 
uh, in regression setting where we have this clear separation of residual and leverage. So we know how the outline is in the y direction versus x direction. They, um, they are different in terms of case influence. For classification, it is not um, as easy. So it is not uh, as easy as in regression. So it, it's hard to separate the effects of those, but at least uh, this figure tells us that what these case influence measures are capturing are not the same as what a simple loss function is capturing. So in a way, uh, this last panel is related to residual idea uh, in regression. All right, so let me summarize uh, my talk. So I talked about how to extend case influence statistics in regression to classification, focusing on support definition. And I presented a particular computational strategy to find the leave one out solutions. The idea is uh, to introduce continuous uh, homotopy parameter, that's a case weight uh, parameter in our case. So using that, we can connect the pool data solution to leave one out solution. So um, there are many different directions uh, we can consider uh, based on this. So for instance, uh, we could think about different classification techniques and apply this uh, idea of measuring case influence. So for example, if we use uh, boosting, then that involves different loss function. So we have to consider exponential loss and the difference in the loss will lead to different computational details. But the overall idea of um, assessing case influence uh, will carry over. And another direction that we are uh, interested in is how to define uh, model complexity or model degrees of freedom in classification using this uh, idea of case sensitivity. So the connection between model degrees of freedom and case sensitivity is well studied and well understood in regression, but that's not, not the case for classification. And currently we are looking at uh, some ways to extend model degrees of freedom uh, in classification using this case sensitivity idea. So I guess this is it. And here uh, are my collaborators. So Shanshan Tu and Yun Zhang Zhu. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be happy to take uh, any questions or comments that you have. Okay, thanks a lot. Are there any questions and, and comments? Uh, well, just uh, here, um, one quick, uh, quick question. Um, uh, it, well, it's very interesting. Uh, as you said, we uh, the linear the linear regression case is very well known. All Mm -hmm. all the formulas for the leave, leave one out uh, mm -hmm. uh, statistics uh, and and that requires a lot of uh, uh, inverting pattern matrices and all that mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how about here uh, uh, you mentioned that the the leave one out uh, uh, the, the local local uh, influence measures doesn't require uh, these uh, individual fittings. So what, and, and you mentioned the homotopy uh, uh, technique. Can, can you summarize a little bit? I'm sorry, but I, I missed the, the key point about the homotopy, uh, uh, the homotopy, those properties that, that makes you uh, to, do not need <laughs> to, to do the individual fittings. Right, so let me go back to this. Yeah. So the idea is, so 
general idea is when you have two problems that are closely related, question is whether we can make use of solution that we already have for one problem to solve the other problem. So those two problems that we consider here are the pool data problem. Mm -hmm. So there we have n data points and we are minimizing this regular support vector machine problem. So we have full data solution and our approach is that whether we can make use of that solution to get the leave one out um, solution. So in leave one out uh, problem, we exclude one data point. And I was saying that these two problems can be connected by introducing this continuous uh, case weight parameter. So when this is one, we have full data support vector machine problem. When this is zero, we have leave one out uh, support vector machine problem. And what I was saying uh, is that because of the very nice computational structure of support vector machine, we can connect those two solutions in a piecewise linear manner. So these uh, optimality conditions are the ones that allow us to do that. So for pool data solution, you can categorize those n data points into three sets. And according to the optimality conditions, we can just focus on those uh, elbow set points mm -hmm. along with one additional linear equality constraint. So what you have is just a set of linear equations. And you solve that system of linear equations and you get the solution. And you identify so in this case, you identify the value of the case weight parameter when these three sets change, when you reduce that omega to zero so in, in, in the negative direction. Okay. So until you have change in the three sets, the solution, the, the solution path changes linearly. So the idea is that you just identify some of those change points in the three sets and at each of those change points, you just solve system of linear equations. You, you identify those solutions and in between simply linearly connect those to get the full solution paths. So mm -hmm. that way you connect full data solution to leave one out solution. And as I have shown in the numerical example, so I didn't mention that uh, these points, they indicate the breakpoints. So in between, you have the small number of breakpoints where those three sets change. So by solving uh, those small linear uh, system of linear equation problems, you get the solutions and in, in between, you just connect them. So that way you connect the full data solution to leave or not solution. So that's, that's the idea. Okay. Okay. Thanks. One, one other question that I, 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 I think I, I'm going to leave it to Johan because it's out kernels. <laughs> is, it, is it this extensible to kernel SVMs? Yes. Oh. Yes. So the, the idea, yeah, works with uh, any kernel. So the mm -hmm. optimal, KKT optimality con conditions, they can be expressed uh, in terms of kernel. So oh, okay, okay. yeah, everything that I said just works for non-linear case as well. Oh, okay, thank you. Very interesting. Thanks. Okay, any other question? Does the classical optimization methods use it in Support vector machine can also be used uh, with this variation of the problem. So when you say classical optimization methods, which methods do you mean? The over the uh, the one with the equal the one that tries to solve the 
the KKT conditions with with the equality constraint? Mm -hmm. So yeah, yes, in fact, uh, this result about optimality conditions for SVM, they are obtained by application of the classical uh, constraint optimization theory. So when you have objective function and you have constraint functions, you introduce uh, Lagrange multipliers for the constraint functions. And here uh, we have to deal with linear inequality constraints. So then you have uh, Lagrange multipliers that are non-negative. So you use the general theory. And in fact, uh, this result comes from the, what is it called? Uh, complementarity a condition. So the Lagrange multiplier and the constraint function, when you take the product, they should be zero. So that way we can explicitly determine the value of some Lagrange multipliers for the, for example, right set and left set. So these are direct uh, consequence of uh, application of general constraint optimization theory. I, I have just one little uh, question. It's about, the, the, um, do you think it's possible to extend uh, this framework to the case of analyzing uh, uh, zones of, instead of just one, uh, one uh, data sample, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, areas of the, of the data space? Mm -hmm. Yes, or, so that's a great yeah. question. That's a great question. And Yes, that's sort of another direction that we are considering. So yes, this um, the framework that I presented is about uh, measuring influence of one observation. But sometimes uh, we want to consider set of observations because sometimes set of observations could have um, masking effects. So we might consider um, two observations or three observations at a time or a fraction of observations. And in fact, we can use the same uh, framework. So instead of attaching case weight to one, case, one observation, we could attach the case weight to set of observations. And one nice thing about this framework is that at least for support vector machine, the computational structure stays the same. So we can uh, use the same uh, idea of um, optimality conditions and then from there, we have kind of similar change in the solution. So I bet if we consider multiple observations for weighting, then not only, um, not only for the weighted case, but also all the other cases will have similar constraints. So generally speaking, we can weight a subset of observations in the, in the same way. We, we just one uh, variable omega, right? I mean, we just one omega. Yes, yeah, right. Okay. So I'm, I'm considering same case weight for uh -huh. set of observations. So okay. same omega for multiple observations. But if you are interested in differential weights, then that can be also considered. And even with that uh, variant, I think the the structure will be, computational structure will be the same. So you are just dealing with same constraint, the uh, quadratic uh, optimization problem. Okay, thank Thanks. you. I have one question. Um, everything you told was for lambda fixed. Yes. Do, do you have any idea how sensitive the curves are if you change a little bit lambda. Uh, so not in the sense of an explicit expression, but more at the level of um, if you make a, a slight change, is it possible or do you have any ex experimental evidence that the curve can change drastically and it has not any predictive power to tell something about similar lambdas, a little bit larger or, or smaller, or you sh it are completely separate problems for every lambda. You have your 
uh, solution path and it's hard to connect them or, or see similar behavior. So that's also a very great question. And in fact, um, when we apply this idea, since we start with pool data solution, actually we have to decide on which value of lambda to consider. Mm -hmm. And then we change the value of the case weight. So if you take this um, problem very comprehensively, then in fact, you are looking at um, two parameters that index the solution. So one is lambda, mm -hmm. so that determines the amount of uh, penalty. And the other is um, case weight parameter for our, our problem. So then instead of uh, one dimensional path, you can uh -huh. think of surface, two, dim two dimensional surface. So the old uh, results that I presented is more like you decide on the good value of lambda first and you focus on uh, measuring case influence at the fixed value of lambda, but definitely you can consider both. And according to the numerical experiments that uh, my student Shan Shan did, what we found was that the number of breakpoints in the case weight adjusted solution pass actually depends on lambda value. So when we consider some extreme value of lambda, then it's almost like degenerate setting that you don't have any breakpoint for some cases. So we found some relationship between uh, lambda and lambda pass and omega pass. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is very empirical uh, yes. observation. But yeah, that's that's great point. And well, regressing to uh, the question of Rogelio, I had to extend it to uh, other kernels in the linear one. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you have always a, a, a big difference between bounded kernels and unbounded one. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the results that is reflected in, in the results you have. So if you take a, a real base kernel, um, it's it's completely different behavior than um, an unbounded kernel, or actually it does not really matter that much. That is also a great question. And uh, I don't have uh, technical details, but I can say a few things uh, about uh, how we might approach the question. So, so here uh, I talked about how the slope of the functional margin uh, changes. Mm -hmm. Also, we can identify how the discriminant, discriminant uh, score changes as we change the case weight parameter. And although I didn't provide explicit form of the slope that we identify, in fact, if you look at that expression, there is a kernel. So that means the magnitude of the slope, the change in the functional margin or change in the discriminant score depends on the kernel that you use. So I, I think if the kernel is bounded, then the magnitude is bounded by uh, some numbers. So I would expect that the rate of change will be generally small. But if you have unbounded kernel, then depending on the position of X, you could have unbounded uh, change in the, in the slope. So maybe that is kind of indirect way to talk about the effect of kernel on the influence. But yeah, I guess that would be kind of interesting direction to okay. look into. OK, good. Any other question or comments? Hi, uh, I would like to make a question. Uh, this is directed to, to see how a professional thinks about open problems. Um, so I would like to ask what are the main difficulties that, that you see when trying to extend this framework to another classification settings? Because for example, I, I think that, well, I, know, I don't know if I'm thinking right, but I see that if you can write this sum of individual contributions, then you can multiply by this omega, the, 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 the instance that you want to erase and repeat the same thing. I know everything will uh, boil down to, to work with the KKT conditions. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm, I, I'm having problems figuring out 
where the difficulty lies. I, I'm not saying that that it's that, that it's easy, of course. I'm just saying that I'm unable to see to see it, and I would like to 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 have a look at how you think about these kind of problems. So I'm not sure whether I'm getting your question right. So are you talking about say if we want to extend this to other procedures, what is yes. the anticipated difficulty? Is it your question? Yes. Okay, so that's, <laughs> so yeah. So at the end, I mentioned a little bit about uh, extending this uh, framework for assessing case influence to other classification procedures. So I was talking about boosting as just one example. And Boosting involves uh, exponential loss. And unlike hinge loss, that is not uh, piecewise linear. So the optimality conditions wouldn't be the same. And I bet we wouldn't have uh, piecewise linearity. So, so, that, so then we wouldn't have uh, as nice and clean results as in support vector machine setting. So we, we wouldn't be able to generate exact uh, case weight adjusted solution paths, but since our interest uh, is getting the leave one or solutions, maybe we can think about approximation to the solution paths. So, so I bet the solution paths will be rather uh, smooth and continue smooth, not piecewise linear. So then it is not possible to characterize that solution paths exactly by getting solutions at particular at some some finite number of points so then we need some approximation scheme so whether you could consider certain uh, grid points with equally spaced um, grid points or some maybe better way to uh, define the uh, breakpoints and then in between, you are not getting exact solution, but maybe approximate solution. So that's uh, one of the issues that um, I could think about if we extend this to other loss functions. Thank you very much for your answer. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other comments? Uh, because well, we put some tamales at the back of your room and they are getting cold. So uh, perhaps just a small question. No. Okay. If not, uh, on behalf of everyone, thanks a lot, Yun. Um, we hope that the uh, pandemia uh, will not take too much time anymore so that uh, we can see you here live for another opportunity. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your talk. Also, thanks to the public. Um, and on Friday, there is another talk also at three o'clock. It will be the last conference of, of, of the cycle. Yes. Okay, good.